let's go ahead and start with kind of giving a, I, I just wanted to kind of talk to you a little bit about how the trip to DC and the tar sands actions went, and then we can tie that into Gwen and, and talk about Gwen some more, and kind of reiterate some of the stuff that we talked about last time, since we found out this. Okay. The footage of that was not that great. Yeah, it's probably worth giving a little bit of background on who I am, maybe, mm -hmm. to start. So, um, I'm Roger Shamel. I live in Bedford, Massachusetts, and I'm a founding director of WEN, the Global Warming Education Network, which will be six years old uh, next year. And we're speaking here on the 10-year anniversary of 9-11, which is constantly in the news now. So um, that's the theme I want to touch on as part of this uh, discussion. And you mentioned the tar sands action in Washington, which took place at the end of August and beginning of September. That was something that my wife Susan and I thought long and hard about because we're not the type of citizen that would voluntarily disobey a police order to move. But that's what we did in a sit-in in front of the White House on August 31st. And so we were arrested and taken to jail for a short time. And because it's a very minor offense, we were allowed to uh, post a $100 uh, fine and be released immediately with hopefully no police record. And. Um, you know, why would we do this? Because we're very, very concerned about the future of um, the climate and um, the whole purpose of Gwen was to form a nonprofit that would try to educate people about climate change and encourage them to act, to do something to help to stop it or at least slow it down. So time will tell whether the um, arrests in Washington, which numbered 1,252 uh, law-abiding citizens, will have an impact. Uh, hopefully it will. We're basically asking President Obama, who has the sole power to do so, to veto the Keystone XL pipeline, which will take tar sands from Alberta, Canada, down to the Gulf Coast of the United States to be refined in Texas, and then sold on the world market. And the concern is that we're continuing to feed the fossil fuel addiction that President Bush admitted we had uh, when he was president. And now we're getting into the really dirty fossil fuels instead of the nice, clean, easily developed ones. And um, to quote Jim Hansen, our leading climate scientist from NASA, the exploitation and development of the tar sands of Canada, which is the second largest oil reserve on the planet outside of Saudi Arabia or the Middle East, will basically mean game over for the climate. So um, it's an interesting situation. I'm, to, to get into a little bit of a background, not what you would call a nature-loving tree hugger from birth. In fact, I was uh, born into a Republican family in the Midwest, in Ohio, and grew up voting Republican and actually still adhere to many of the values that um, the Republican Party had then and still has today. For example, I, I don't like regulation per se. I don't like big government per se. I don't enjoy paying taxes and then hearing that the government's spending $100 for a hammer or, or something like that. I was a member of a group that was against uh, government waste. So uh, it's interesting. I recently looked at a speech that was given at the super secret um, Koch brothers meeting out in Colorado for right-wing executives and millionaires, and um, there was a, the speech by Governor Christie of New Jersey there. And I don't have it in front of me, but as I read parts of it, he was talking about how 
you know, everyone here wants to preserve the wonderful American free enterprise system, and we want America to be strong and great. And if I had been sitting there, I would have been applauding with everyone else. Yeah, that's what we want. So um, that's one part of me. The, the other part of me is that I did grow up um, on 13 acres in Ohio, and um, we had a horse and a dog, and I'd explore the woods and the creeks, and so I do have some connection with nature, and, um, you know, that's not like people that grew up in a city environment. Um, and that brings to mind Bill McKibben's book, The End of Nature, which he wrote 20 years ago or so, and um, I've read parts of that book, and the basic thesis is that as we go forward through time, fewer and fewer people are connected with nature because more and more are growing up in urban settings and people are actually getting to be more afraid of nature, like, you know, don't go in the woods alone. And, and um, to some extent that's okay, but on the other hand, the, the disconnect from nature seems to mean that people don't um, notice the changes that are taking place in nature with climate change. And I want to try to cover some of the interesting facts about climate change. There, there's a lot to condense into what I hope will be a cogent and concise discussion. Um, and I don't want to dwell too much on the past either. I want to get into talking about what can be done about all this because that's the whole point. It's, it's not, you know, where have we come from. The, the point of when and of my involvement is this, is that as a human who cares about other humans, and as a parent and a grandparent and someone who has compassion for people, I just don't like the situation I find myself in, uh, seeing us moving towards a problem that's getting bigger and bigger, being involved in a problem that's getting bigger and bigger, without doing something about it, when we have the technology and the money to solve the problem. It's just like, you know, it's mind-boggling to me. And um, something else you need to know about my background, uh, besides the Republican upbringing, and I, I voted Republican right through, I think, the first term of George Bush, I'm almost embarrassed to say now, looking back. Um, there's a connection with nature, but there's also the, the science in me. I'm a um, master's degree chemist from Ohio State. Um, so I understand science, and I can read charts and graphs. And then I spent um, a couple years at Harvard Business School reading an MBA, so I understand business and what motivates business. And then I spent seven years as a project manager at Arthur D. Little Company, a large consulting firm in Cambridge, and there worked on collecting information and analyzing it and helping clients to understand what it meant and helping them to predict the future. And I even taught a course with a, an organization every summer in New York about how to do business forecasting. So then I left Arthur D. Little and started my own consulting firm in 1981. And so for the past 30 years, I've been running my own consulting company. And again, my whole career has been to collect information and to connect the dots between fragments of information and then to try and weave it all together into a, a report that helps our clients understand what to do and, and often looks into the future. So I'm, I'm used to doing that. So I think those parts of my background, uh, for better or worse, um, give me an ability to look at the science of climate change and um, knit it together and see what's coming. And um, despite all that background, the fact of the matter is that it wasn't until six years ago when one of my daughters suggested I go see this movie she had seen called An Inconvenient Truth that was put out by Al Gore. And I distinctly remember, up until that point, I had read about climate change, and you know, I get the chemical magazines, and and I basically thought, well, it's just some scientific argument back and forth. And when they figured out, you know, the government, as it always 
does uh, will step in and solve the problem. In fact, I'd worked on the hole in the ozone layer problem at Arthur D. Little as a project manager, and we helped direct the US EPA in this study uh, as to how to regulate the fluorocarbons that were the basic cause of the hole in the ozone layer. And at that time, Reagan was president, and he worked with uh, Margaret Thatcher in Europe and and others to work out uh, the Montreal Protocol, whereby nations agreed to limit fluorocarbons so that they would not cause a hole in the ozone layer, which would not be good for man because it lets more ultraviolet light come in and that's damaging to humans in terms of skin cancer and damaging to crops in terms of uh, damage to the chlorophyll. So, um, sitting through Inconvenient Truth for an hour and a half or so is the first time that I'd really been able to or forced to think about the climate change issues and being able to understand the graphs that Gore had pulled together and he admitted he wasn't a scientist, he's just pulling together the research that's been done, I thought, oh my God, this really is a problem and so why isn't the government doing more? And um, that was the beginning of uh, the thinking about Gwen. And Susan and I had a trip planned to Europe shortly after that, and we noticed in Europe that there were wind turbines in um, Scandinavia, and people were doing things. And we came back to the United States and said, well, it must just be that people here don't quite understand the problem. So what are we going to do? Well. We could start a nonprofit, and and so we we got 501c3 status for Gwen. It's a you know official nonprofit, and then we thought about raising money, and it turned out it was very difficult to do, and it led to a lot of constraints. And I'm not one who loves paperwork. In fact, doing work for the government <laughs> at Arthur D. Little um, it was one of the things that uh, fed my um, concern about the way the government was doing things. So anyway, we formed Gwen, and we thought it would be easy to get the word out. Um, and it turns out it hasn't been easy. It's now five years later. Um, if anything, it seems like things are worse now in some ways than they were then, because we have the leading GOP candidates, um, such as Rick Perry from Texas, claiming he doesn't believe that climate change is real. Um, or Yeah, and the, the only candidate of, you know, the many that are out there that seems to be talking about it being real and respecting the science is John Huntsman, who comes out of the Huntsman chemical realm, so he understands chemistry and business. Um, but it's really, it's something that I think about almost constantly and talk about with Susan. And I'm, I'm lucky that Susan, whose background also includes science and a career in physical therapy, has allowed her to pick up from my science and do her own research and conclude that it's also a problem. So we talk about it every night at dinner. You know, what's going on? What can we do? How can this be happening? Can you believe? they said that, and um, it's funny, when the evening news comes on, and, and lately it's been more and more about, you know, the fires and the droughts in Texas, the flood, you know, 10 inches of rain in Louisiana, then 10 inches of rain in Pennsylvania, and 30 bridges washed out in Vermont, the town of Killington, Vermont, isolated, and helicopters bringing food in, and, and we say, this is all climate change or global warming news basically because it's exactly what's predicted by the scientists. There's going to be more drought in the southwest. There's going to be more moisture in the air in New England. Uh, there's 4% more moisture in the air around the world because the warmer air can hold more moisture. Um, even the earthquakes and tsunamis we've seen, uh, again, as a scientist, uh, I can go to a handbook of chemistry and physics and look up the coefficient of thermal expansion for basically rock, granite or sandstone, and 
The Earth has warmed about a degree during the Industrial Revolution from climate change. And when you multiply one degree times the coefficient of thermal expansion for rock, you basically have to expand the Earth's circumference by um, a quarter of a mile to account for the thermal expansion around the 25,000 mile approximate circumference of the Earth. Well, that quarter of a mile is uh, very likely to be loosening those connections that are holding the plates of the, the Earth's crust together, and so you're very likely to accelerate earthquakes. And so anyway, Susan and I see what's happening, and we're thinking, yeah, climate change. So we even then should turn on the weather, and the weather people are saying, oh, wild weather we're having. And I remember one leading Boston weatherman when asked on a weather show, why are we having all this? heat and so on. And, and the answer was, well, we just seem to be locked into a warm pattern. I mean, it was nothing remotely scientific. Um, and when people do get into the science, uh, they very quickly get into something that's over the heads of the average citizen. They start talking about El Nino or other climate effects, and people uh, mostly don't know what that means. So. Um, it's frustrating to know what we know um, and not be able to do more. And we're constantly working to do more. There, there's the, the myth of Cassandra, who had the power, I guess, to see the future, but nobody would believe uh, what was being foretold. Um, so Gwen has done a lot, and I don't want to dwell on that, but I just want to make the point that we have tried everything a person could logically do to try and get change, you know, and, and we, we've, some of it seems really small and insignificant, but it's, it's interesting just to do some of these things to get the sense of what people are thinking or talking about. So we've tabled at the local store handing out information on Earth Day and talk to people. We've tabled at the farmer's market giving out information. We've called and visited our representatives and senators at the state and national level. We've gone to Washington to talk to them. We've written letters. We've made phone calls. We've sent faxes uh, to all of the relevant public officials, even beyond the state when, when a, a senator and California, Henry Waxman, suggests that Secretary of Energy Chu should have an educational program to inform the American public. We wrote to Chu and we wrote to Waxman and we said, yes, do that, do more. Um, we've gone beyond the politicians and the tabling to follow Bill McKibben's climate movement, first with Step It Up and then with 350 and then Bill was the uh, the real leader that was visual behind the tar sands movement and the uh, protests and resulting arrests at the White House. And um, we haven't just followed that, we've organized rallies, a huge rally on October 10th of last year, 2010, at the Old North Bridge in Concord. We call it a revolutionary energy rally. We had people there from close to 40 towns, numbering 500. We had Minutemen, um, speakers, uh, politicians, entertainment, and we thought that would have a bigger impact than it did. We even had Bill McKibben's mom there who lives in the area, and, and there were thousands of these rallies that were organized across the country and around the world, and that was like the, the third of those that we'd done. And with all 